Why couldn't I have that after the sermon? That was good. That was really good. I'm going to play a game with you all. It's my favorite game while I preach. It's called You Be the Pastor. Actually, we won't play that one. We won't, that's, a, that's an easy one for some of you. Like, oh, I know the answer to that. Go golfing. Like, no, no, no. That's a, so we're going to play a different, a variation on my favorite game called You Be the Pastor. This game is called You Be the Pilot. You Be the Pilot. Any former pilots out there? Any former pilots? Oh, of course, yes. Yep. Okay. So, so I may bot, totally botch the whole pilot lingo thing. So I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, Bob. Just, just bear with me. Okay. So this, this situation comes straight out of a book called Everybody Always by Bob Goff. He tells a story. He's a, he's a, he's a, a, a speaker, author, and he also happens to have his pilot license. Well, he was going to one of these uh, speaking engagements, and he was going from San Diego to Palm Springs. And he didn't want to drive. So he decided to fly. He rented a really cheap $100 an hour airplane. And he took that thing, took off from San Diego, made his flight plan. Mountains are about 6,000 feet tall. He flew at 8,000 because he doesn't want to die. <laughs> you know, he just he fly over that. He goes and lands in Palm Springs, does his speaking engagement, takes back off from Palm Springs, goes back over those mountains, and goes back to San Diego, and he's about ready to land. So he does the typical landing procedure. He flips a switch. I think it's what you do is flip a switch. I'm not quite sure. You do something to activate your wheels, to get your wheels to come down and to lock in place. And you're told that they're locked in place by three lights, two in the back and one in the front. And these three lights light up until your wheels are locked. So he flips a switch. Here's the wheels go down. And only two lights light up. The two in the back. The front one, no light. What do you do? You're the pilot. You don't have a parachute. What do you do? Well, this is where we find ourselves in life. You don't have a choice whether or not to get on the plane. In fact, oftentimes in life, these two light situations happen in a seasonal basis. If not one big picture two light situation that happens throughout your life. You're trying to land, you're trying to get somewhere, and only two of the three show up. What do you do? What do you do? Thank you. That, to be honest with you, that is actually the very end of the story. The light bubbles burned out, but you just took that from me. <laughs> this is a lesson why you... Sh well, actually, I did ask for that. I asked for that. I asked, I asked you the question. So, um, <laughs> But, <laughs> all right, see you guys. <laughs> um, so what do you do? Don't answer. <laughs> Don't answer. Don't answer. What do you do? Rhetorical question time. What do you do? Well, in life... In life, you can't always just change the light bulb, right? You just don't know. Like, you don't know what's going on. So how do you live that out? Let's read today Psalm 27. It's a psalm from David. You know, David lived in a lot of ways in, in two lights, with two lights showing out of the three. And Saul came and tried to kill him on a regular basis. His best friend was the son of this person who's trying to kill him. Not only that, but he had some wild conflicts with nations all around him as he was king. I mean, he lived in two light world all the time. Sometimes one light. But let's read and listen to and for the word of God in this triumphant song of confidence of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. 
One thing I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter. In the day of trouble, he will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me on a high rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God, of my salvation. If my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this word. And we pray that it does indeed build courage in us for the days and months and seasons ahead as we together seek your face. In your name we pray. Amen. So, this passage today, I firmly believe this passage today speaks to us in this place at this time, in this way, that we can trust in God's unfailing love in the midst of all of life's unknowns. That we can trust in God's unfailing love in the midst of all of life's unknowns. And let's face it, there are plenty, not just for David, but for us. Is anyone else ever really confused about the way the world is supposed to work nowadays? How much it's changed so much, even from when I was young? And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it has changed a ton. And now I find myself behind sometimes on technology. I don't know what to do. I started learning how to code because I'm like, I think you're going to have to learn how to do this someday. It's going to be like managers. It's be like working on your car. If you don't know how to code, your, car, you know, your computer's just going to break down and you're going to have to spend just a ton of money to get someone else to fix it. I'm serious. I don't know what to do. And even the way my, my kids kind of operate in the world is different than the way I did often. And this is the world we live in. It's a, it's a world of two lights, sometimes one. And we don't know what to do. I, I mean, you feel like if you, if you take the next step, something bad's about to happen. If you try to do anything, you could die. <laughs> Not literally, and maybe literally, right? And that's the world we live in. And that's the world David lived in, this two-light world. But... As David writes in here, we can trust in God's unfailing love through all of life's unknowns. How? By living out these two principles. Not mine, straight from here. First principle. In verse 8, David says, seek his face. Seek his face. In the midst of life's, life's doubts, in the midst of the faith that's been built into you over time. And where those two commingle, we are called to seek God's face. See, this passage, one commentator put it this way, real fear lives alongside honest faith. Unlike the song you sang, which was very glorious, it didn't quite capture the part where David was actually like questioning, are you going to actually show up? That actually happens, friends. That's real. And it needs to happen in us. It happens because it's honest. You know, you can say, oh, it's going to be fine. I'm totally fine. No doubts. I'm done. 
don't, don't even, don't bring it up. That scares me. I don't want to talk about it. God is good. God's going to take care of it. But see, that's not really honest. Because the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's certainty. The opposite of faith is not doubt. It's certainty. Faith takes something more. And faith and doubt actually coexist. Actually, faith and doubt are the seeds of new faith. When you allow that place, allow yourself to be in that place, and when you do it, not just at home alone, like fretting and fearing, oh, I have doubts, oh, I have... Not like that. When you do it together, in community. When you join with people of the faith tradition that we're in, when you join with the community of faith and you work through those things together, and you allow other people to bring those things, and don't be afraid. Don't be fearful. Don't say, stop saying that. That's not true. Listen. Sometimes people will be saying stuff that you really need to listen to. I don't know, where is God right now? Is that dangerous? Can I say that? Are we allow ourselves and each other to say that? They actually found that um, the kids who grow up in churches where you're not allowed to question faith at all, those kids actually far, far often than others who do, that are able to, those kids that are not allowed to question, don't stick with faith into adulthood. If you tell them, don't question, statistically, it's, they show it. They, you, those kids actually don't hang on to their faith as to, as as much as kids who are allowed to ask questions in a safe place. But yeah, you actually work it out with people. Not like at home thinking, oh, this is really bad, so I'm going to look it up on the internet. Nah, not that, not that. With a real community of faith, someone at their side, and that's you, and that's me, that's us, together. It can be allowed. See, when we seek his face, here's the interesting thing. You see that passage, and it says, seek his face, come my heart says. Seek his face. This is interesting. I know you probably hear this all the time in sermons, but I really firmly believe that this is meaningful. You have to see the verb. Is it a singular verb or a plural verb? In this, my heart, in this passage, come my heart says, y'all seek his face in the country version. Y'all seek his face. You all, you plural, seek his face. Now, some of you could be like, Oh, that's just because David is a torn individual. He has many different sides. I, I don't think that this going into that deep psychology part. I really think it's a command. And David is representative for the people of God. He's not just himself. He's not just sitting there as just one person. He is a representative as the king for the people. When you see and you hear David saying this, he's talking about all of us together. Which is why you cannot seek his face by yourself. You, it won't be very good. It'll be kind of crazy. You need someone else. So that story I told you, you be the pilot. You're up in that plane. Two lights. What do you do? Now, I'll, now you can answer. Now you can answer. What do you do? You're up in that plane. What is it? Pray. Pray. There you go. You can absolutely pray. Just keep it brief. I'm serious. You better keep it brief. What else do you do? You're up in that plane. Call the tower. There it is. That's it. You have a radio. You call the tower. So that's what Bob did. Bob called the tower, and the tower said, okay, top gun it, buzz the tower. I want you to come right through. He said he felt like a hot shot at that point, even though he was about to die. And he came right through, and he buzzed the tower. It was very dark. So the tower couldn't see anything. Tower said, do it again. Goes through. Couldn't see anything. Couldn't buzz the tower again. Wouldn't do any good. They couldn't see what was really going on. But he did buzz the tower. He did exactly what he needed to do. He asked. And sometimes the community of faith says, I don't know if you've ever seen anyone fiddler on the roof. Have you seen that? I, I, I actually just watched that for the first time the other day, which is crazy. I needed to watch it a long time ago. On the other hand, on the, sometimes the community of faith is just telling you, on the other hand, there's this. On the other hand, there's this. On the other hand, and you, you never get the end of it, right? And you really don't have a clear answer. And that's okay. You've sought the community of faith. You've done it together. You've, you seek out his face and you do it together. 
And sometimes there are no clear answers, and that's okay. You need to still do it together. So the first principle is seek his face, but make sure y'all seek his face. Do it together. Don't do it alone. The second principle. The second principle is wait for the Lord. Wait for the Lord. You can see the irony in this one with the example I gave, right? Wait for the Lord. Jesus, take the wheel. Take it. Right? You can't, you can't do that. Like you're gonna, this is not good. And it's, now you, now I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be dismissive of like a real faith where you're like, yes, Jesus is going to do this thing, right? No. Because that's what David is saying. It's going to happen. God is going to do it. But I do believe that David was never a person who would just sit back and say, I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to let God do this. Now, there were times that happened. God gave him victories and battles that he had no business, right, winning. And God sent him in. But he didn't just sit back at all times and say, okay, I'm going to wait for God to do everything. No. He had to keep moving, sometimes for his life. He couldn't just sit back and wait. Friends, waiting for the Lord is not doing nothing. Waiting for the Lord is acting in the courageous confidence that after you've sought the community of faith, after you've really discerned what God is calling you and this community to do, after that, you take the next faithful step, knowing that God will act either before, during, or after that step, so that all will be well. We don't know what that means. We don't always know what that looks like. It might not look like a beautiful, easy landing every time. It might be pretty rough. But we do know God will be there. That's what David says. I trust in God's unfailing love at all times, throughout all of these unknowns, even though an army encamps around me. This just sounds ridiculous. But he does. And that's what we have an opportunity to do. This is the good news this morning. This is great news. That we can trust in God's unfailing love through any of life's unknowns. You see, David says in verse 14, it takes courage that God will build this courage into us, that God will give us this courage. You know, courage comes from the root, a French root. It's a, any French people, I'm so, you know, French speakers, I'm so sorry. I'm going to botch this too. It comes from the French root for heart, cour. Huh? Close. <laughs> Something like that. It's actually the root for heart. That's what courage is. It's like a heart muscle. And God builds this into us. Courage means taking a known risk for a known reward. It's not just craziness. It's not just jumping off a building because you just want to. That's not courage. That's stupidity. Right? Courage is taking a known risk for a known reward. After you've sought the face of God together in community, then you take the next step. Even though there's only two lights showing, you must take that next step. There's two things you cannot do. Two things. You can't do nothing and you cannot do the same thing. Especially in these days. We can't do nothing. And we can't do the same thing. Friends, we see it all around us, this nation, and, and, and Christians and churches. It's not looking pretty when churches do nothing or they do the same thing. Things actually need to change. I'm not saying what that is. But after we've sought together the face of God, we take the next step. We wait for the Lord. Don't just stand there. Wait. Because wait means move. But wait, because God's going to, every time you take that step, and you do, you've done it in community, and you've discerned in community, God will act. So just wait for it. That's what he's saying. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait. Oh, wait for it. I got it. That's what this is saying. But you have to take the next step. In your personal life, could be calling, could be career, could be relationships, anything. You must take that next step after you've discerned in community. It, as a church, we are just at a, at, a, at a very, I think, awesome moment in church history. This is, this is pretty interesting times we live in, friends. This is almost, 
you know, Reformation sorts of times right now, the way things are going and what's going on within the church right now. And we have a grand opportunity to step up and take that next step and land the plane, even though there's only two lights showing. So what happened? What happened with Bob? Bob buzzed the tower, found nothing. He had two lights out of the three. He didn't have any bulbs. <laughs> so someone can tell me what he did. What did he do? He landed the plane. At least he attempted to. Came in. Got down slowly. The back two wheels touched. And he counted down. Three, two, one. He took a big breath. And the third wheel touched just fine. All three wheels were out. Paul Arndt was here today and he told me that happens sometimes. He told me he'd have to shake his plane to get the wheel to, to stick in place. That sounds freaky. I'm sorry. But it happens. And the third wheel touched and he was just fine. And he went back to the mechanic after and what had happened? It, it was a five cent bulb that burned out. Five cent bulb. That's the only thing. He would have, what would he have done? Something else crazy because of a five cent bulb. How many five cent bulb problems do we have in our life that we make so big? It's just a five cent bulb. Now the wheel could not be down. But what are you going to do? You got no parachute. You ain't going to survive that fall. You got to land the plane. And in this life, we get to land, especially as a community of faith, we get to land the plane together. That is our calling. And no five-cent bulb is going to keep us from doing that. Amen?